Uh, but before we go on, in case you guys don't know, uh, Ji Tun is, of course, a very famous figure uh, in equities in this part of the world. He is the Chief Investment Officer of Asia Pacific Equities at RHB Asset Management Singapore. Um, Ji Tun, let's take a quick look into the outlook for this quarter. Because um, as we know, the China equity market or the MSCI China has been bashed down by more than 20% last year. Broad MSCI Asia Pacific X Japan also is down by 17% on the same period. However, we do see some light in terms of rebound from the Chinese equity market, where the rebound was actually by 30% for MSCI China from November of last year. And post what we call a volatile 2022, how would you allocate your equity portfolio within the Asia Pacific basket or market? Okay. Um, happy New Year, everyone. Um, very good to be here. Uh, hello, Ibrahim. Uh, so going back to the question, I think we need to talk a bit about the backdrop of 2022 first. For 2022, I think there were only you know a couple of asset classes that actually mean absolute return, and that includes only just US dollar as well as a couple of the commodities, right? Other than that, I think most major asset classes out there, including fixed income and as well as equities, all lost money in 2022. And I think that 2023 will be very very different, right? There will be a few pivotal changes in the market which includes, in our view, the end of the aggressive interest rate hikes that we are seeing in 2022. And we do think that inflation has probably peaked uh, in most countries um, by the end of 2022. And and I guess, I guess related to that, our, our view is that we would see a peaking of the US dollar as well. And more importantly, um, in our parts of the world, a few key things have changed uh, since the end of 2022. One is obviously the reopening of China, or rather the end of the China's zero COVID policy. And last but not least, I think China is also loosening on a variety of fronts, including military, including physical, as well on a variety uh, of other policies, including uh, the Chinese internet, as well as on the Chinese property uh, sectors as well. So as a result of that, in terms of portfolio allocation, uh, we are very positive on China, and we do think that uh, an overweight in China is probably law overdue. We have been uh, underweight China for the longest time. I think with this change in particular, like what I mentioned earlier, at the end of China's zero COVID policy, we do think that sectors in China, including the tourism, hospitality, F&B sector, will benefit, right? Uh, there will be a significant boost to consumption as well as an increase in industrial activity as well. So these are some of the uh, key reasons why we think China will do well. And also in our parts of the world, right, um, in ASEAN in particular, right, with the developed markets in Europe, in UK and US undergoing a bad patch in 2023 with probably some form of weakness or might we uh, even say a recession in 2023, then I think the countries of ASEAN, uh, which are mainly more insular and more domestic driven, will be well supported, right? And also in ASEAN, we are seeing probably the first full year of reopening since our own reopening from the strict lockdowns that we have seen all across ASEAN in 2022. So I think 2023, uh, on the back of that reopening, will be quite well supported in terms of equity uh, prices. So in particular, we like the more domestically exposed countries of Thailand and Singapore. So these are some of the key uh, regions and countries that we are positive on in 2023. So Jitun, uh, away from countries uh, and um, I guess regions, when it comes to sector, which are the areas that you think is worth looking at? What sector would come to mind for investors seeking high returns and of course investors who are looking for steady growth with some downside protection? Um, and of course, uh, on top of this, what's your view between growth and income stocks in Asia Pacific? Okay, and sectors that we like would include um, the tourism sector, the hospitality sector. Uh, that is on the back of the China reopening that we are seeing right now as, as we speak. And of course, uh, the reopening of ASEAN over the course of the second half of last year. And we should obviously continue into 2023, right? And, and on top of that, right, because of that reopening, as well as the return of uh, tourists and business to this part of, of the world, we do think that uh, the consumer sector will tend to do quite well, right? And in terms of the industrial sector, 
we think that there will be a revival of industrial productivity uh, due to the reopening as well as the increase in tourism. So which will result in airlines and airports doing much, much better in 2023 compared to the previous uh, two or three years. Last but not least, uh, the Chinese internet sector is a sector that we are positive on. I think we have seen the last of the intense governmental scrutiny on this Chinese internet sector. So I think 2023 will be a year whereby these uh, stocks in this sector will tend to do quite well uh, post the intense scrutiny that we saw over the course of the last 20, 24 months or so. And in terms of the high return sector, we do think that the internet sector uh, does have a lot of, of potential. Like one mentioned earlier, I think the end of the Chinese government scrutiny on these companies will provide a very good platform for these companies to grow. And we do think that there will continue to be attractive growth opportunities in the internet sector. And last but not least, I think valuations are actually very, very attractive at this point in time. And the other higher return sector that we are looking at is probably the technology sector. So we do think that the tech sector, probably in the first half of 2023, will be under a bit of pressure due to what I mentioned earlier in terms of the um, softening economies in the developed markets. But uh, probably from the second half of this year onwards, we would see a fair bit of this bad news being digested as well as the high inventories of this, a lot of this uh, technology components being digested over the course of the, uh, the last nine months or so. So these are some of the sectors that we think are quite interesting. And in terms of uh, sectors with steady growth and with uh, pretty decent downside exposures, we think that the Chinese banking sector would probably look fairly attractive on these few metrics. Uh, the reason is um, they do have pre pretty decent loan growth coming into 2023, especially with the Chinese government providing extra stimulus. And on top of that, we are seeing pretty high dividend yields uh, that these uh, Chinese banking stocks are giving at this point in time. So we are looking at somewhere in high single digit for a lot of these good quality Chinese uh, banking stocks. Uh, last but not least, I do think that uh, this is a year whereby the Real Estate Investment Trust or the REITs uh, will probably have some form of free grief. A main reason behind that is because we are seeing some form of picking of interest rate I guess not just in the US, but also all across the world. But however, I do think that we need to be very selective here, right? So we need to look for REITs that are operating in attractive segments, like for example, in the hospitality segment, in the medical tourism segment, and also in the logistics segment. So this, uh, the REITs that operate in these three key segments will tend to do quite well, okay? And last but not least, just to answer your questions in terms of my view uh, between growth and income stocks, I think the Asian growth stocks are actually more attractive at this point in time. Reason behind this is 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 simple. I think mean, valuation is is indeed very very cheap for the last uh, year of 2022, right? With the aggressive interest rates um, hikes that we saw all over the world, I think growth stocks in general have been bashed down pretty badly. So as a result of that, I think I think the Asian uh, growth stocks are, are 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 not spared as well. So at this juncture, with the reopening. Uh, of China, as well as the post of hiking of the aggressive uh, uh, interest rate that we see all over the world, I think I think uh, the growth stocks will tend to do quite well in this kind of environment. You know, you're talking about the reopening of China. Let's talk about the possible impact of the China equity markets. And of course, in addition, how do you think the portfolio is a position to take advantage of the significance of the reopening of China versus the China's zero COVID policy? Okay, I think in terms of the reopening, I think there are three key main impacts that we can think about, right? One is through sentiments. The other one is through actual earnings impact. And last but not least is through flows, right? In terms of sentiments, right? I think the consensus view is actually very, very negative on China. So as a result of that, right, um, the valuations in China are at multi-year lows at this point in time, right? So uh, in particular, after the China Party Congress in late uh, uh, late 2022, I think that was the point of maximum pessimism, right? I think sentiments is indeed very, very bad, right? So I do think that with this zero COVID policy coming through, I think sentiments will change for the better, 
right? And also in terms of what I mentioned earlier, in terms of actual earnings impact, right? With the reopening, we are expected to see consumption uh, pick up. We are expected to see uh, industrial activity going back to the norms to pre-COVID. And last but not least, also in terms of trade flows, right? With the end of this uh, lockdowns that we are seeing in China. And with all of that happening, right? So in terms of fund flows, okay, our view is that there is a consensus underweight in China and in Asia at this point in time. So I think the recent very strong performance that we talked about earlier in terms of the 30% rebound that we saw from the end of, 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 of October, I think that will probably give a lot of these fund managers who are underweight China, who are underweight uh, Asia food for thought after they come back from their uh, Christmas break. So I think that will, that will, that will in itself create a virtual cycle that will lead to better performance for China in general. And also in terms of positioning, how we have positioned for the China reopening is uh, we have been overweighting the Chinese internet sector and we like the consumer sector uh, to take advantage of the consumer picked up. As well, I mentioned earlier in terms of the industrial sector as well, because we are going to see um, uh, more airlines uh, um, operating out from China and, uh, and then of course the airports as well as the duty-free shops would tend to benefit in this kind of environment, right? So hospitality, F&B in general would also benefit on the back of that. So that's, these are the key, few key sectors and stocks that we are very positive on and we have positioned for the portfolio to take advantage of this uh, China's reopening. Uh, on top of this, I want to learn more uh, about what you think about the ongoing conflict uh, that is currently happening around the world um, and the ongoing US-China tension. Uh, business and manufacturers, for instance, are seeking to diversify their businesses out of China, perhaps even into Indochina. What do you think uh, ASEAN countries uh, should think about, especially when it comes to benefiting from this in the long run or some of the risk uh, uh, assessment that is going to happen in the short run? And of course, what about the short to medium term positivity from this sentiment to the equity market? Uh, at least in South, uh, uh, sorry, in Asia Pacific. Okay, I think it's inevitable that ASEAN will benefit over the medium to long term, right? So, and countries that will benefit uh, um, because of this ongoing conflict between US and China, uh, the, the countries that will benefit would include Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and obviously Malaysia, right? So, um, uh, the China plus one policy is probably. Uh, uh, a strategy that most MNCs would probably undertake over the course of the next few years, right? However, I just want to highlight to everybody that um, that this will pan out over the the medium to longer term, because it is actually it will actually take time for any industry to build an entire ecosystem. So we can't just pluck a factory out from China and expect it to operate independently in Vietnam. Right, so we do need to time to see an ecosystem that has to be built to support uh, any industries that will be displaced because of this current U.S. Uh, China tension. Then the other thing I just want to highlight is that I think China uh, will still remain very, very relevant, and I think the reason is because uh, due to the sheer size of the Chinese population, with 1.4 billion people, I think China affords a huge manufacturing base advantage to uh, manufacturers who are willing to base their operation out from China. I think uh, ASEAN, I think despite a uh, lower, obviously, cost of production, I think due to the sheer size of China's population, I do think that China will still remain relevant for the foreseeable future. Last but not least is also the fact that China in itself is a very, very important domestic market, right? So I think... Um, international MNCs who will still have to give uh, that sector quite a fair bit of thought even when they are moving some of their operations out from China, right? And last but not least, I guess I want to, what I want to highlight is also that some of these Chinese companies themselves are involved in setting up manufacturing bases in ASEAN. So, so I think that uh, this is a trend that will probably play out for the foreseeable future over to the mid to long term. 
You know, the ease of travel requirements in China allows for citizens there to travel outbound to foreign countries. But in your opinion, are Asian countries ready to accept travelers from China or Hong Kong? And are there any catalysts in this area, such as the tourism industry or consumer discretionary and other um, sectors uh, that might be uh, affected by this move? Okay, I guess in the short term, right, I think some countries out there may be a bit wary of the high numbers of uh, COVID cases in China. And I do think that in the short term, there might be some pushback, right? And and I think the pushback would, would entail some form of PCR test prior to the actual flight itself, right? But I don't think there will be a broad-based uh, pushback in terms of acceptance of the Chinese tourism money. Right, so I guess over the next few quarters, I expect some form of normalcy, right? Especially with the positive examples from countries that, uh, who have no restrictions uh, um, against uh, the Chinese citizen, right? So once we have a few uh, good uh, weeks or good months of 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 data, I think more and more countries would be jumping on the bandwagon to embrace the Chinese tourism money. So, and in terms of the beneficiaries, like what I mentioned earlier, I do think that the uh, companies that operate in the tourism sector will obviously benefit, right? And that will increase the consumption in these countries that we are talking about. And hospitality, FNB, uh, airports, airlines are some of the key uh, segments that will benefit. And last but not least, um, in certain countries in our parts of the world, I think medical tourism would come back in full force over the course of the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, do you think that some geopolitical tensions in the Asian region, in particular US-China tensions and uh, China-Taiwan relations are going to be impacting some of the decisions that you are going to make or perhaps some of the investors' uh, ideas on uh, on their move for this year? Sure. I think the geopolitical tensions are indeed um, very, very current and very, very relevant in this current um, environment. I think the US-China tensions are probably here to stay for the foreseeable future, right? So I think that the US sanctions that have been put on some of technology sectors uh, will probably hurt China in the very, very short term. But over the medium term, I think China will benefit from being more resilient and being more self-sufficient, especially in the technology space, right? And also more importantly, I think the Chinese government have been putting in significant amount of resources in order to cultivate and support their local champion, especially in the high tech space. So these are some of the considerations uh, that we have when we look for some of these local uh, champions that are listed in these parts of the world, right? So I think there'll be winners and there'll be obviously be losers, right? But I think it's very clear that the Chinese government will support the local champion, and 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 therefore, it's uh, we are spending quite a fair bit of, of of effort in trying to identify who are going to be the key winners, uh, in this new normal. Okay, and last but not least, I also want to highlight that certain Asian countries, like for example Taiwan and Korea, will benefit because of this U.S.-China tension. So that's why we have also allocated quite a fair bit of our our of our portfolio into buying sectors and companies that will benefit as part of this US-China tension, right? And last but not least, in terms of the um, Taiwan-China uh, relation, I think our base case that is that China will not invade Taiwan. And in fact, Biden said pretty much the same thing during the G20 uh, meeting in Bali uh, late last year as well, right? So I think the relations between uh, Chai, uh, Taiwan and China will be frosty, right? But I think both sides will be practical as well because end of the day they are neighbors and also obviously taiwan depend quite a fair bit uh, on, on china in for a lot of their industry as well so i think this is uh, uh having having good relations is probably a win-win situation for all parties you know, we, we spoke on all uh, a, a lot of topics, um, geopolitical tensions, China or reopening, many more. But uh, maybe we haven't touched on some of the key risks that you think is important to talk about for this year. So what is, in your view, are the key risks for this year that we need to look out for uh, on top and above and beyond what we have discussed earlier on? Sure. Uh, in my opinion, I think there are four key risks uh, for 2023. 
I think the first and the biggest one would be the impending recession in the US and Europe. So at this point in time, I think the market is probably expecting a mild recession or a soft landing in US. So I think the jury, in my opinion, I think the jury is still out uh, for that one. We have to monitor the severity as well as the duration of the recession in US and in Europe. And also more importantly, what would be the negative impact that the developed market recession would have on the rest of the world, right? Despite the fact that I think the rest of the world is slowly picking up uh, and getting on its feet uh, in terms of the reopening because the developed market were the first to reopen. So last year was their first full year of reopening, right? But for a lot of uh, the Asian market, I think this is our first full year of reopening. So recession is one key uh, uh, a risk that I'm looking at. And the other thing is also, I'm also looking out for whether the inflation will be stickier than what the market is looking at. And I'm especially watching out for the wage inflation in the US because my view is that the wage inflation is in the US is a supply side issue. So right now what the US government, uh, 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 Fed uh, is trying to do is trying to control wage inflation through uh, affecting the demand side. Right, so I'm, 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 so I'm watching out uh, whether the wage inflation will continue to be much higher and for much longer. And obviously, if that's the case, then that will have an impact on the interest rates trends as well. Okay, and the third point that I'm looking at is what we mentioned earlier: geopolitical risk. Right, I'm watching out for whether there will be a uh, escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war. Right, whether more and more countries will get involved, or might there be some form of resolution? Right, and we have talked about this. And the last point is. To, uh, that, that affects us in our parts of the world will be the relations between US and China. So we're watching out for any form of, of improvement or in any or if this relations deteriorate over the course of this year. And last but not least will be COVID, right? So I think everybody's watching our web for whether there will be a, some form of, of mutation uh, in the COVID virus over the course of 2023, right? So whether the new variant could be more virulent or could be more deadly. But at this point in time, I think the base case is that I think uh, life will go on as per normal. I think the, all the different countries all over the world will start to open up. I'll be watching out for a new COVID mutation, right? So this is an important uh, risk that we have to be watchful for uh, as part of 2023. It's uh, just to recap, the four areas of risk that you're looking at is recession in the US and Europe, the severity and duration of this. Um, you're looking also at the inflation, whether or not wage inflation through um, uh, the US is going to be affecting the demand side and therefore interest rates. Geopolitical risk, especially one of that of the US and China, whether or not it's going to be curated moving forward. And of course, COVID. COVID has always been the risk since 2020. Yeah. Agreed. Anyway, uh, Jitun, thanks very much for uh, sharing your views. Uh, this has been yet another series of Money Chat um, where, where we look at the market outlook for 2023, not just for the first quarter, but for the entire year. That was Tan Jitun, the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Asia Pacific Equities at RHB Asset Management Singapore. We've also been speaking with um, a few other luminaries from RHB Asset Management on what they think about the year is going to pan out and the risks that are going to be involved with it. Uh, so do check out the entire Money Chat series for all the conversations that we've had before this. My name is Ibrahim Zani. Catch you in the next one. And of course, I wish you all the best and Happy New Year to everyone that's watching.